even if we have intelligent children and qualify in as far as the actual performance is concerned, they are still having to pay for the job that they are being interviewed for. You see? Opinion that historically, Nagas are Indians by circumstance, not by choice. From the very beginning, Nagas have lived free, undominated by any foreign people, and therefore there is a very strong feeling within the minds of all thinking Nagas, not wanting to let go the freedom that we have enjoyed, and that's in our blood. So look at that, I mean, people keep voting for the same corrupt people basically because they are also a greedy population that also believes that, well, we are going to see this MLA only after five years, when he comes again next time for the, he's not going to look at our welfare, he's not going to be bothered about what happens to us. So this is the time when we can take at least something from him. Hmm? If they stood for development and equal opportunities for all, then stop selling votes hmm? and then vote for people who can really work and do welfare job for the people. Whole range of uh, situ situation that uh, is just out of control. Completeness of what Nagaland politics is all about. I don't think we have much to look forward to. Where is this Naga political issue is heading? Look, uh, it's quite a complex situation and uh, the facts and the truth is so camouflaged that uh, people have become absolutely confused. It's only the pressure of uh, illegal taxation. In the whole scenario, the NSCNI is more or less the lead negotiator under the given circumstances here. But they have never been able to come forward on a transparent scale to let the people know, the stakeholders, when I say people, we are the stakeholders for whom they are negotiating. That uh, the issue of sovereignty and integration are not part of the solution. Welcome to Nagaland TV, Sob Monolawas. Aji, Arik Bar, Abni Gala Samne De, Arik Talutun Episode Loi Naya Sen. Ar Aji La Episode De, Abni Gala Guest Bi, KK Sema Ayes Sen. Abni Gala Sob Jana Nis Na Abni Gala State Law Ekta Renowned Person. To Aji, Iti Ahala Bi Reason. Ar Aji Topic Bi Kya Sen Abni Gala Naste Sepra Aage Bar Ginom Hani Tu Jana Idu Bo. Ar Kya Sen Gule Mendo Politics Ar Naha Naha Political Issues Ar Different Issues Mahala Thaga Itu Law Bade Mohan Ek Bar Kotha Guru Gui Naya Aji Iti Ahi Nase. So, sir, first of all, thank you very much for giving your precious time to us. Mohan, first, move Kurubo, Abni Lode. First, Mohan, I need to know what is the current situation of the politics of Nagaland? I think uh, the political situation is as messed up as messing up can be. Yeah. The Oppositionless government being set up for no apparent rational reason, and uh, the present politicians are only looking for their own political survival. It has nothing to do with the welfare of the citizens in Nagaland, development sectors, especially the road sectors or health sectors or any other given departments as you look at, you have a whole range of uh, situ situation that uh, is just out of control. And uh, with the corruptive system in which every minister and MLA are looking for their own welfare to win the next election, that is the main agenda of a political uh, efforts in the state. 
and, uh, and therefore I'm afraid uh, Nagas are a cursed people with this kind of a, a government that runs clearly unconcerned about the welfare of the people and uh, it's a sad situation for all of us, the, the mere public, to have such a political system in which you only buy power and get into a place of uh, power just so as to uh, misuse all the development funds for their own personal welfare. So I, I guess that's more or less the completeness of what Nagaland politics is all about. I don't think we have much to look forward to. Thank you, sir. So we have another question, and this is a very hot topic of based in Nagaland. So uh, based on the present circumstances, where is this Naga political issue is heading? Look, uh, it's quite a complex uh, situation and uh, the facts and the truth is so camouflaged that uh, people have become absolutely confused. It's only the pressure of uh, illegal taxation that is putting the pressure on the people to want a quick solution. But uh, I have said this over and over again, hoping that our Naga people will realize what is the ground reality of uh, the Naga, Naga uh, government of India and uh, the Naga peace process that's ongoing. You see, from the very beginning, I've held an opinion that historically, Nagas are Indians by circumstance, not by choice. From the very beginning, Nagas have lived free, undominated by any foreign uh, people. And therefore, there is a very strong feeling within the minds of all thinking Nagas, not wanting to let go the freedom that we have enjoyed, and that's in our blood. But I think we need to take a look at the total picture very carefully and see what is happening on the ground as it is and understand where we as stakeholders stand in the whole scenario the NSCNI is more or less the lead negotiator under the given circumstances here. But they have never been able to come forward on a transparent scale to let the people know, the stakeholders, when I say people, we are the stakeholders for whom they are negotiating. And so it is important for them to realize that Whatever they are trying to do is in the interest of the people, Nagas of Nagaland, Nagas everywhere else, you see? So that the future that is being attempted to be carved out of this negotiation is on a healthy platform where the stakeholders know what is in store for them. It's the whole future and the future of the gener young generations coming up and their children, you see. So when you are dealing with such an important perspective of a Naga destiny, it is imperative, it is important, it is a must that the stakeholders must be kept informed in a very transparent way. But the NSA and I is not doing this. You see, they are concealing everything speaking half the truth and hiding the other part of the truth, which is very, very uh, unfortunate for the Nagas as a whole. Now here, 
the, the totality of the problem is, you see, as I have already mentioned, the Nagas would want, emotionally, everybody is looking at that freedom, self-determination, as a very, very integral part of our lives. But then, when you look at the negotiation ongoing, all the factions, if they think that they have been given a mandate by the people, they have been given mandate for sovereignty and integration. Now, Mr. Muiva himself has already made it clear in 19, uh, I mean, uh, 2012 that uh, the issue of sovereignty and integration are not part of the solution. And that was a year before the framework agreement was signed. So if you look at the, the picture of how the frame, uh, framework agreement has uh, come about, you will see that issues such as shared sovereignty comes up, in which the government of India looks at shared sovereignty as some uh, in the similar status as that of the states in the Indian Union, where each of the states have certain authorities empowered. The center has some powers that they exercise independently. There's the concurrent list and the state list. So from that perspective, the government of India has been talking about the shared sovereignty, whereas the NSC and I am talks about shared sovereignty as if Naga, Nagas are getting complete independence and that they will share the authority with the government of India, you see, as an independent entity, which is not the case. Huh? Every solution that has been talked about by the government of India is within the Indian constitution, not beyond. And the fact that NSE and IM has signed the framework agreement gives us some kind of a concrete conclusions that even they have agreed on those basic principles. Now, you see, at the moment I have been explaining exactly how the NSE and IM is planning this negotiation over and over again about the state of Nagaland becoming a Naga nation, a nation for all Nagas, no matter where they are living. But then when there is no integration, the, the meaning of a Naga nation without integration is a, an absurd logic and uh, devoid of uh, rational uh, clarity here. You see, Arunachal and uh, Manipur Nagas, they are getting regional autonomous territorial council huh? because there is no integration. Okay? Because there is no integration, they are getting autonomous regional councils in which the government of India will be funding them in completeness for administration, development, management, every other expenditures. They are going to get that back up from the government of India because the government of India is unable to consider, consider the issue of integration. So here you go, sovereignty, according to the government of India, is the, the one I've already explained, whereas the NSA and I am despite saying that sovereignty and integration are not part of the negotiation anymore. And that being said by somebody at the uppermost echelon of NSA and I, Mr. Muiva himself, you see. So here you have the state of Nagaland becoming a nation for all the Nagas from everywhere, despite the fact that the territorial Naga territories it, in Manipur, Arunachal, are not going to be added, or Assam, to be added to the state of Nagaland boundary. So, I have been saying that our southern brothers are planning 
a very treacherous kind of a projection where once government of india is taken out they take the rule of a colonial power southern brothers controlling the state of nagaland as they are controlling it with the guns in nagaland as it is now and they want to continue this by projecting situations like this that the state of nagaland will become a naga nation for all nagas no matter where they are living it necessarily and i have said this again and again that it's the same thing as saying that they will enjoy whatever privileges they get in their own territory where we have no share we have nothing to interfere in their boundary territorial councils that they get in manipur and in arunachal but on the other side they get the privilege as a citizens of a naga nation within the state boundary of nagaland you see so what they are literally saying is mine is mine yours is ours you see they'll enjoy the privileges exclusively but they will also enjoy the same privileges as we have in the state of nagaland with the nagas of nagaland you see for me i say that such a plan cannot be acceptable it is not fair and the nagas of nagaland must come up with a strong clarity to tell the nsni people that if they are truly fighting for the greater good of the nagas as a whole then such plans that is unfair should not be a part of the negotiation now they have also put in another part of their competency demands that they are asking which is the pan naga ho it is the same structure like the naga ho ho that used to exist where all nagas from everywhere had clubbed together to form that naga uh, uh, naga ho ho now they are calling it the pan naga ho ho which is structured in the same manner and the nagas of nagaland will be a minority in that formation that's number 1 now in the naga nation nsc and i says that there will be two houses the upper house and the lower house okay the lower house is the elected members but the upper house here is the catch the upper house the nsc and i is designing their demand from the government of india to make pan naga ho ho a very authoritative body who will be having the power to nominate members into the upper house okay there will be two houses the upper house lower house the upper house will be filled up by members who are nominated by the pan naga ho now the state of nagaland it is within the state of nagaland and the pan naga ho will nominate members in the upper house and they also say that any bill that is to be passed by the lower house has to be approved by the upper house nominees of the pan naga ho ho and until the upper house approves the bill such a bill cannot become an act you see it means that the pan naga ho ho is going to be much more powerful than the the elected government you see and their own definition of pan naga ho also is that the chairman is a complete total dictator who can call assembly who can dissolve assembly who can jail you who can execute you who can do anything but everything huh? as a chairman and uh, with that kind of an authority they want to control the state of nagaland which becomes a nation and continue to control every aspect of what happens within the state of nagaland despite the fact that there is no integration you see now these are two issues that they have declared nsnim has made made it public that the state of nagaland will become a naga nation that they will be a pan naga ho ho and the internal plan is to have the pan nagaho controlling the state of nagaland after the 
solution is ended, okay, after the conclusion of the negotiation. So today they are controlling Nagas of Nagaland with their guns. Tomorrow they will do it on a legal format through the Pan Nagaho and keep on holding our throat and control the lives of the Nagas for generations to come. These are two of the only issues that they have declared. They have made it public. And if the two declared contents of whatever schemes they have in their mind is as dangerous as this and detrimental for the state of Nagaland, I say that uh, the Nagas must firstly stop talking about quick solution. We should be focused on finding out exactly what NSCN IM has in store for the Nagas of Nagaland hmm? with the rest of the other competency clauses, as we call it, within that framework agreement, they are placing demands, which is called the competencies. And so, without knowing exactly what those competency clauses are, you see, our future is going to be decided by them without telling us, without telling the stakeholders. And therefore, I have been saying over and over and over again that it is imperative, it is absolutely imp important that the Nagas of Nagaland must ask the NSC9 to let us know exactly what they are demanding from the government to be there in completeness, transparently, so that the people can fully endorse it or tell them to change whatever is detrimental for the people of Nagaland, the state of Nagaland. You see? Now, I have come to the conclusion because we have been asking the NSC and IM to please show some respect to the stakeholders. They are not negotiating with the government of India for their NSC and IM cadres' welfare. They are talking about the stakeholders, that's the total population of the Nagas, be it in Nagaland or be it elsewhere. And if that be the case, it is important that they must let the people know what they are demanding. And so, since we have asked them for the last five, six years, please let us know what are the contents of the competency clauses, and they are not doing it. I have come down to the basic conclusion that, well, it is all right. If they do not want to show the Nagas the competency clauses that they are asking the government of India, then go ahead, take it to Manipur, and implement it there, whatever competency clauses they, they want to settle with the government, let them implement it in, in Manipur and in Arunachal, but not within the state of Nagaland. The people of Nagaland will decide our own fate. That is more or less the area of conclusion that I have come after taking out so many campaigns and trying to make them understand that it is our welfare, it is our right to know what our future is going to look like. And for people like us, the older generation, you see, when I look at your age group, hmm, I see the future that's going to be as bleak as hell, hmm, when they will enjoy everything on their own and then still come in and ask for the same rights and privileges with the rest of the children living within the state of Nagaland. I think that is totally unfair and that cannot be done and therefore as a senior generation I wouldn't want to let such a thing happen in our watch, in our generation's watch. Okay? So that is a very critical part in which I've been campaigning and I've been saying very bluntly that NSA and IM, if they are willing to show the competency clauses to the people, fair enough. If not, take it to Manipur. We do not need their competency clauses in Nagaland. Okay, sir. Okay, okay sir. So this means it is like, uh, you know, uh, folding in cloth, the cloth of lie in our eyes. They're trying to close out whatever is happening. This way. So, sir, uh, one more thing we want to ask. Uh, apart from now uh, political issue, but actual political issue. Let's come to political issue. Uh, w I want to ask, is Rio trying to safeguard his throne? Is he going to safeguard his throne after 2023 election? Look, 
politicians as a very general statement, let me say this, no politician will be looking for the welfare of the people as part of their political life. Huh? Politicians are only concerned about their survival and their survival alone, no matter what way it comes. They are more than ready to do everything but anything to maintain their position at all costs. Huh? Welfare of the people is not an agenda in their thinking. Hmm? So yes, why not? For him, no matter what, how many years elections may come, he will be always looking to protect his own position. That's part of politics as far as I'm concerned and that's exactly what he will do. He'll look after himself. Thank okay. you. So, as, as I say, uh, you know, and we have also seen what was the earlier, which party had in power in the governance. And so, as regarding that, what I want to ask is that, will NPF be able to bounce back from their seat back and come into the power again? Is there any possibility? Because we see many people, you know, supporting them or seeking them again back to power. But why is this, sir? You can tell us. Look. It's uh, the most unfortunate curse that the Nagas are going through by electing people who are able to buy them. You see, the, the total population is looking at an election purely as a period in which they can make money. Based on that, it's a matter of what NPF has as their coffer, in their coffer. Are they competitive enough with the Rio's party or not? Hmm? Because all of them are going to have to buy votes. You see, our people, no matter what we tell them, are going to continue selling votes. We've been trying to tell the people that this franchise is a very important responsibility, each vote that we cast based on the need and the well-being as a basis of voting rather than buying, being bought. Because the moment you sell your votes, your rights are gone. You see, when you go to a shop and buy a commodity, once you have paid for it, that commodity becomes yours. How I use that commodity is purely mine. The right is mine. If I buy a shirt and tear it up, if I buy a watch and smash it up, you see, the shopkeeper cannot tell me anything. It's my right. It's the same analogy. When the candidates buy a vote and win, you see, what they do after that, they are not answerable to us. We have already sold our rights to you. You see? So what you do is of no consequence. I have no right to ask you to develop the roads hmm, or to uh, improve the health services or improve the educational system and so on and so forth. You see, they are not answerable to the people. They have purchased your rights. It's as simple as this. You see? So when people are selling the roads, it becomes a very difficult proposition. So the basic rotten equation is does NPF have enough money as NBPP to contest the election? Of course this time the situation is uh, getting a little complex because all the 21 MLAs that have crossed the fence to uh, join NBPP, you see they all want tickets and now NDP, they are going to be sharing seats with the BJP as per whatever is happening now. Under those circumstances, you never know how many of the people that cross the fence may come back, whether the NPF will take them back or not. But I would say that the present generation, the youngsters are beginning to come up a little more actively and wanting to join politics, there are going to be a lot of 
young generation fresh faces. So depending on the capability of uh, those youngsters that come in and how many of them will join NPF, that's another perspective. I would believe that uh, NPF will also share the same burden of uh, misgovernance since they are also a part of the government. It's an oppositionless government. So whatever burden that Mr. Rio has, Mr. Sirozile also have to bear that burden of misrule. You see? So to that extent, I do not know what will be the public perception because in Nagaland, we don't seem to really look at government in any logical way. They only look at who is in power at the center. And if BJP joins the NDPP in the seat sharing equation, NPF has a very difficult uh, task ahead of them. So financially, as much as that there is a BJP government at the center and BJP working with Mr. Rio's party will definitely enjoy the cloud. So NPF is going to have a difficult time. As you sir, mentioned about the youth of Nagaland has to see the generation as, as the same. How do you see uh, the parties like uh, RPP, the Rising People's Party, it has been brought up in the state, newly formed. And also there is NPP, National People's Party, from the, so, what do you see? Do you see any future of these parties in the Nagaland politics context? You see, Naga People's Rising Party, or whatever they call themselves, they are all youngsters with very less experience. But in politics, you see, everything goes. Now, with this much of disgruntled uh, MLAs that are going to come up when the ticket is issued, there's going to be a whole lot of people looking for one party or the other at the end of the day because uh, most of them wouldn't want to go in the, on an independent ticket. They will be independent uh, candidates as well, but generally being identified with the party. So, People's Rising Party, whatever they call themselves, they are activists, people who have been conscious of whatever is happening, the misgovernance, the, the rackets, corruptive rackets that are going on. They are pointing out a whole range of this uh, misgovernance of the present state government. Now, the issue of incumbency can become a very critical issue during the election. Okay? How far can they carry the message to the people for two things. Number one, to stop selling votes. How far can they convince? Because as a fresh party, I am more than sure that they don't have the working capital, okay? Financially, I'm talking. And when I say financially, when a party is weak, it has a very difficult uh, task ahead because, as I said, the people are going to sell votes and the no amount of teaching the public that selling a vote is detrimental. So when we look at the financial side of it, all these new parties are going to have a very difficult time. But perhaps the momentum can be built up if they can project exactly what Mr. Rio's government has done for the last 15, 20 years in terms of development or in terms of any other infrastructure because there's been almost zero, uh, I mean, inferior kind of make-believe developments, making roads for the sake of contract, huh? where the people in the social media, you see, once in a while, you see people peeling out the, the black topping with their own hands. You see, just the show. Huh? Works that are being done are, are all corruptively given to the contractors. Contractors pay very heavily, and therefore, they also do a very perfunctory kind of a job because even they have to profit. 
from whatever they are doing. So it's a vicious cycle, you know, where you sell votes and the parties that are coming up also have to have money in order to buy votes. So when you ask me about a new party like uh, Naga, uh, Naga People Rising, all of these sectors will have sincere people wanting to really change at least a system of governance. But if they have to buy votes, no matter which party it is, they will never be able to bring about change. You see? Because if you win by buying votes, you are mortgaging a lot of things, you are selling your property. You see, the holiest, good, honest people that go into politics can never remain holy, honest, and upfront. They'll never be able to work for the welfare of the people. So the rising party also, if they buy votes, in which case they'll be basically the same as Mr. Rio or Mr. Sirozile or any of the politicians, there'll be no difference. But if they can win without buying votes, then that change can come and that change can probably be possible if they are able to convince the public as to the kind of damage that is being caused perpetually by selling votes and also uh, focus on the lack of infrastructure, lack of development, the corruption that is proliferating the whole system. If they can bring out all of these things properly, I, I do believe they have a fighting chance if they can do that exercise. Same as the NPP, whatever, at least there are people who are in government. And so maybe they are financially a little better off than the Naga People's Rising. Or, uh, Rising People's <laughs> Party. <laughs> I, okay. don't, I don't really know. Okay. So, uh, as you say, this is the truth of politics, what yeah? you mean. Yeah. Absolutely. So, thank you, sir. And uh, once more, as we have spoken about the politics, and come to the, you know, uh, the outcome, what we have seen and we observe in our politics here. Every time the Naga people says this uh, corruption prevails in the system, but they are again voting for the same party or for the same candidate and after that they again start complaining. What could be the reason, sir? Well, there's, there's not, uh, it's not difficult to describe the totality of what our people looks like complete stupidity. Hmm? They sell votes. That's the key in the total system of corruption that gets built up right from the start of the election. When the people sell votes, you are setting up the corruptive system. And as I said earlier, the moment you sell your votes, you have sold your rights. You have no right to complain. You see? And the politicians also have no choice but to buy it because people are selling. Hmm? So it's an equal responsibility, you see. People are selling because there are people who are going to buy it. Huh? Or people are buying it because they have no choice, the votes are being sold. Either way, it's a political responsibility that has to be borne bought by the, 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 the public voting populace as much as the politicians themselves. But it's a, it's a hard uh, situation here because uh, the system is built in such a manner. So, you see, when that is the system, that is the system, you see, the corruptive norm will not disappear. It's going to be repeated over and over again. And as I said, uh, the, the only way we can describe the whole system is downright stupidity of our electorates as much as the candidates themselves. Nobody is really looking at the futuristic way within which we can grow on a cool, solid development of infrastructure and various other prospective developments. And we can do as best as any state if honesty is a system, a part of the system. But everything but everything is a complete corrupt uh, norm, down to the extent of all these backdoor appointments or you say NPSA. You see, people are buying their jobs, you see. We have reached 
the law as such, you know, to such an extent, where even if we have intelligent children and qualify in as far as the actual performance is concerned, they are still having to pay for the job that they are being interviewed for, you see. So look at that. I mean, people keep voting for the same corrupt people basically because they are also a greedy population that also believes that, well, we are going to see this MLA only after five years, when he comes again next time for the, he's not going to look at our welfare, he's not going to be bothered about what happens to us. So this is the time when we can take at least something from him. Hmm? So with that kind of an attitude, with that kind of a philosophy that our people are having in their minds, you see, it's stupid, you see. They don't understand that whether the MLA comes back or not, that's beside the point. But if by way of principle, if they stood for development and equal opportunities for all, then stop selling votes hmm? and then vote for people who can really work and do welfare job for the people without any burden of all the loans because most of these MLA's candidates that they go, they are selling land, property, mortgaging even their own living houses, you see. And with a Naga loan of 10%, you buy, you take a, a, a loan of one crore, you are paying one lakh per month, you see. And then when, if you happen to win and get into a small department like arts and culture, yes. you know, the budget is only three crores. Hmm? Out of the three crores, more than uh, two crores, 60, 70 lakhs goes for uh, management of the office, stationery, salaries, and so on and so forth. So you get 20, 30 lakhs yeah. as a development fund. You have spent crores in the election. You see, that's why they fight for big department portfolios. Huh? Yeah. Once they win the election, that's the way it is. You see? Okay. okay so... So, sir, do you see Mr. Yu uh, coming back to power? Well, I, uh, from, the, from the perspective that I keep saying, in Nagaland, even a rat yeah. can win an election. Hmm? It is possible for even a rat to win an election in Nagaland as long as you are having a lot of money, you see? So your cats, your dogs, your cows, your pigs, the whole lot of them, if they have money, they will win elections. You see, so Mr. Rio, as far as he's concerned, he can buy the state of Nagaland now. For the last 15, 20 years, he's been the chief minister. Hmm? Now he's got financial strength that he can buy the whole of Nagaland. You see? So seeing things from those perspectives, I think uh, he has the strength to be able to back up each of his candidate members of his party to the hilt. Hmm? So I, I, I have a feeling that he is going to come back again, you see, under those principles, hmm? because he has the money. A 20-year treasury is in his house. Even financial backup. Yes. yes. Okay, sir. So this will be our last question to uh, Will BGP and NDBP will coexist in future in the state? Look, politics is a very strange kind of a game, huh? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right at this point in time, they are talking of uh, seat sharing. Now, in whatever manner that they want to do this uh, seat sharing, for the time being, they are going with it. But for all you know, when the actual game is to be started, BJP has been in government. They are a government in the center. Yes. And in, a, in terms of financial capabilities, they have built up their reserve. I am sure of that, you see. So they'll be as competitive as uh, NDPP themselves with Mr. Rio. The only party that can definitely be competitive with Mr. Rio will be the BJP. Hmm? 
and with all the central cloud as much as whatever they have been able to do because they have run the government for the last five years now, almost five years. Uh, they are reasonably uh, stocked up money-wise to be able to actually go in for uh, all the 60 seats independently without seat sharing, you see? Because, uh, the, as I said, the total population looks at money and looks at who is in power in the center, you see? These are the two simple political thoughts that the Nagas, the common Nagas have. You get money, you get a bolero, you get a scooter, you get a motorcycle, you vote for whoever. But they again feel more confident to vote for somebody who is a member of a national party which is running the government in the center. You see, so when all of this picture is put together, I we cannot be very sure that uh, Mr. Rio's party and uh, the BJP will continue. For all you know, BJP may break free and say we will contest all the 60 seats. You see, so it's uh, it's circumstantial. The moment situation comes up, in uh, whatever way they read, there is every possibility for the BJP to break free and. Uh, contest the whole 60 seat, and uh, probably they will do much better on their own also in a way. You see, because uh, as I said, financially they are going to be reasonably strong, you see. So when they are able to do that and compete with Mr. Rio, I have a very strong suspicion that at the end of the day, for all you know, 2023 election, BJP may just go on their own as well because the seat sharing is going to get very complicated with these uh, 21 NPF people who have come in, all have come in into NDPP on the promise that they will be given uh, their uh, party ticket, you see. But Mr. Rio has his own old uh, candidates. He's going to have to displease that in order to please the defection people that come from the NPF, you see. So Mr. Rio's uh, got a very hard homework to do in his hands as to how he distributes his ticket. So when all of these complications builds up, it might weaken Mr. Rio as well. There'll be a lot of disgruntled people from within the NDPP who will, who will change uh, loyalties and change sides. Okay, uh, sir. So this means what we have learned here today and uh, after looking everything in the state of politics. It's mean, uh, you know, the members or the candidate, it's jumping to one party to another for just to take their whole or into some kind of position or in the department. This is how our politics is yeah. that we have understood. So uh, this will be the last question to you again. Sir, you, as you were the retired IS officer, we want to ask you, I hope you have seen whatever is happening between the department, this department also. We want to know that, sir, how, how one department should function what their ethics should be. And this, do you see in our Nagaland, either it be Nagaland police or other department who has been signed by the civil, you know, you call it as a civil services. Are they following the ethics of rules? Are they going according to the law? Well, yes, I've been in service. I've crossed a lot of bridges. And... Uh, I know for a fact, first-hand experience as it were. Yeah. You see, when we talked about how each of these candidates go in for election, win the election, and then start fighting for the biggest department, it is for a reason. Huh? They want to make up their election investments. So that's at the top of the hierarchy. They are the ministers in charge of departments, and the bureaucracy is working under that. Now, here, the basic ethics is that all our ministers are mere public. They don't know the rules and regulations of things, essentially. And based on those general, not that all politicians are the same, but 
They are the laymen in terms of rules and regulations and the governance part of it. And therefore, the bureaucracy is the fundamental base within which we are supposed to guide the ministers to carry out their assignment on a legal frame. You see? So, say, let's say, when you have a development work to be done, you float tenders to give that contract work to any of the contractors, we float tender, okay? We float tender and then see who is the lowest bidder or who is the highest bidder, whichever way the situation demands, and you basically give it to the one that have qualified in the tender that they have competed, you see? But that doesn't happen. Most of the departments do paper tendering, meaning they may, for official record, pretend that they have issued a notice. Now, here what happens is a contractor looking for work is bribing a minister. Hmm? You see? And the moment that happens, see, the minister is more than willing to send down order to the bureaucracy in the department, to the secretaries, the commissioners, and so on, to award that development work contract to Mr. A, who has bribed him. Okay? Now, bureaucracy basically is to advise the minister that we cannot just give it to Mr. A, who you are recommending. He has also to go through a tender process. And if he wins, only then can he be given. But again, circumventing that rules and regulation, they would let the Mr. A, who has bribed the minister, go through the norms of uh, uh, tendering. And if he does not win, if it's supposed to be the lowest bidder, then the department, the secretaries, you see, because here, in all frankness, the secretaries, the chief engineers, the engineers, the whole line from top to bottom, the contractors bribe. Okay? Start with the minister, 10%, 5%, 6%, 2%, down to the overseer in the work site, right? All along the road is being, is being bribed. So even the secretary gets bribed. So when they issue a tender notice perfunctorily, but there's somebody who is bidded lower than the contractor who has bribed the minister, they would negotiate with him, that, uh, the tendering contractor who has bribed the minister, to agree to do the work at the lowest tendered rate. It's a negotiated rate, you see. Now, that's Ill illegal, you see. But the commissioner secretaries, the chief, uh, uh, the, the engineers, they are all prepared to close their eyes because they also get the benefit of the bribing system. And this is basically a norm rampant. Huh? No department is free of this. Appointments, basically the same. Backdoor appointment, as you call it. Ministers are bribed, the secretaries are bribed, the directors are bribed, hmm? and then you are appointed. So the whole bureaucratic system, which is supposed to be the guide to the political wing, you see, have become an accomplice to the corruptive system by doing what the minister orders them. You see, many of those secretaries would say, unfortunately, sir, we couldn't do anything. The minister was adamant. He ordered that it should be done. Where are the rules for? What are the rules meant for? And what is your responsibility then if you're just going to carry out the orders of the a minister with closed eyes, you see, you're not upholding your responsibility. But I'm afraid oh, almost 80, 90 percent of the uh, total bureaucracy is within, most comfortably within the system of corruptive motion, you see. And therefore, I think bureaucracy in Nagaland has failed to the extent. Look at the, just say, even like prohibition. Huh? I mean, it's a farce, they know it. And the 
politicians are afraid of, afraid of the church. Even the church people are selling their votes. So what are the politicians afraid of to get rid of this hypocritical uh, issues like uh, the prohibition? You see, it's no use knowing well, well that the system has failed, but you still carry on with it. That's again political fear that the church will go against the party that removes prohibition. You see, you see stupidity after stupidity. Huh? And we are going through all that. The public is just a solid, stupid spectator. You see? That's the way it is. Now, there's one thing about the political issues that uh, I need to address before we conclude. You see, right now, the problem that has been looked at as uh, a stumbling block or a roadblock is on the issue that the NSC and I am is talking about the flag and the constitution. Yes. Everything, according to the government of India, has been concluded by the time the framework agreement had been signed. And I have said whatever, but now the flag and the constitution has become the ultimate demand, you see, by the NSA and I. I just wanted our people to know that if NSA and I claims that the state of Nagaland or the nation of Nagaland is already received sovereignty, hmm, that it's going to be a sovereign country sort of a thing that they are trying to project, NSA and I. You know, it defies logic. You see, because no independent country asks for a flag or a constitution from another sovereign nation. Hmm? If you are considering yourself as a sovereign nation, the flag and the constitution are a protocol that does not require any permission from any country. Yeah. You see? But on the one hand, they are talking about Naga's sovereignty has been achieved, kind of a claim. And yet, here they are asking for flag and the constitution. Is it? What does that... Even a simple equation like this ought to let our people, Naga people, think. Huh? Because a sovereign nation does not ask any other nation for a flag or for a constitution. Is it? So, and then furthermore, they say sovereignty, sovereignty, shared sovereign. Why are we asking for enhancement of seats in the Rajya Sabha and the Lok Sabha in the parliament? If you are a sovereign nation, what are we trying to do in an Indian parliament? If you are a sovereign nation, you send ambassadors yes. to another foreign country. You do not ask for Rajya Sabha seat or Lok Sabha seat, you see. But they are asking to enhance the Lok Sabha seat and the Rajya Sabha seat. You see, how long are the Nagas going to be fooled? You see? And the sad part of it all is NSCNA as, as the chief negotiator, you see, there isn't anybody but anybody within the NSCN IM Carter, you see? Who will question Mr. Mueva? Not one. Be it the Southern Brothers or the Nagas of Nagaland or Nagas from anywhere else. Huh? No one would dare question Mr. Mueva. So what does the picture give? Huh? That the total Naga destiny is being controlled by one human being called Mr. Mueva, the General Secretary of NSA and I. Think about that very carefully. The total destiny of the Naga population and their future is being controlled, dictated by one human being called Mr. Mueva. To what extent do the Nagas look at themselves? Huh? All the time talking, whenever we talk about ourselves and our ancestry, oh, we are courageous warriors, you know. You see? Today, those courageous warriors cannot even have the, the courage to stand up 
for what is right, what is the truth. You see? We are shit scared. Hmm? And we still talk and brag about our bravery. Hmm? Naga is a cowardly race now as it stands today. Huh? And this is where I say the younger generation must understand that the total impact of whatever NSA and IM is trying to do will be detrimental to them, to the younger generations, completely and totally the direct impact will be on the younger generation if they cannot see through the schemes that NSA and IM is planning for the state of Nagaland and the Nagas of Nagaland. They want to keep that control even after the solution comes. And if that is what the Naga youth, the younger generation, feel acceptable for them, then go right ahead and just keep supporting. Otherwise, it is about time. It is about time that not only the elder generation, but most of all the younger generation must clearly see, forget the sentiment. As I said, we feel we are, we have the right to freedom, but we've got to look at the evolving world, the overview of the global scenario, and if we can carve out our own rights, our own identity, our own dignity in a given society, we have to relook at our ancestral philosophy of that independence that we have fought for so long and look at the new world with a new pra pragmatic perspective rather than continue with the old thinking process and then when we do not even achieve that we go into the second gear and go into a, a mode whereby the younger generations are all going to be destroyed for generations to come and therefore the younger generations must begin to get a little more aware aware of the grounding wake up and start looking at the reality more carefully otherwise we are damned people. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your time again. And so here, again, again we are saying this to our viewers, that we have to understand whatever we are doing, the, today's action of ours will be the result for tomorrow in our future. So here comes again that whatever we are doing and whatever we are looking or listening, whatever it is, we have to understand. We have to understand the situation and we have to bring out the solution ourselves within us and we have to think what it could how and where it could lead us and that's here our episode ends and we'd like to thank our viewers to watching uh, till the end here and thank you i'm your reporter musarraf ali with video journalist bendang sanam jamir